Welcome to Double Line's second annual Roundtable Prime, moderated by Double Line Deputy CEO Jeffrey Sherman. Five thought leaders in today's financial markets will discuss their take on the economy and their outlook for the financial markets. Roundtable Prime was recorded on January 5, 2021, and will be divided into three segments global macro economy, financial markets, and best ideas. Each segment will be released separately once a week for three weeks in January. The roundtable guests, all with decades of experience in the financial markets, are recognized leaders in macroeconomic analysis, market research, and investment management. They bring together a broad array of knowledge across different sectors of the financial markets, including fixed income, credit, equities, real estate, and commodities. All have been sought after for their insights as speakers and as commentators in the financial media. And now, Double Line is pleased to introduce the honored guests of Roundtable Prime, our moderator and our host. Jeffrey Sherman will moderate today's discussions. Mr. Sherman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line Capital and a portfolio manager of a number of Double Line's fixed income and derivatives-based strategies. He also hosts the Sherman Show podcast series, which has featured many of today's distinguished guests and was named one of the 10 must-listen podcasts by Business Insider in 2020. Ed Hyman is Chairman of Evercore ISI, where he heads the economic research team. For the past 45 years, Ed has been ranked by Institutional Investor Poll of Investors for Economics and ranked number one for 35 years. Ed Hyman is highly regarded for his origination of econometric modeling and real-time surveys to gain insight into the unfolding business and market cycles. James Bianco is president and macro strategist at Bianco Research, which he established with the aim of originating insights unencumbered by traditional Wall Street research. His commentaries address such diverse subjects as monetary policy, the intersection of markets and politics, the role of government in the economy, fund flows, and positioning in financial markets. Jeffrey Gundlach, host of Roundtable Prime, is founder and CEO of Double Line Capital, an investment manager with investment strategies in fixed income, equities, real estate, and commodities. In 2012, 2015, and 2016, he was named to Bloomberg Magazine's 50 Most Influential. In 2017, he was inducted into the Fiazzi Fixed Income Hall of Fame. Danielle DiMartino Booth. Danielle DiMartino Booth is CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence, a research and analytics firm whose commentary appears in the Daily Feather and the Weekly Quill. Prior to Quill, she served throughout the credit crisis as advisor to Richard Fisher, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She is author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Fed is bad for America. David Rosenberg is President and Chief Economist and Strategist of Rosenberg Research & Associates, an economic consulting firm providing analysis and insights to investors. Prior to founding his firm, he was Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef & Associates. From 2002 to 2009, he held those positions at Merrill Lynch in New York, where he was consistently ranked in the Institutional Investor All-Star Analyst Rankings. Jeffrey Sherman, Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line, will now open the second of three segments of Roundtable Prime, Financial Markets Outlook. Okay, Great. everybody, welcome back to uh, segment two of the second annual Roundtable Prime. Uh, we're going to continue our, our conversation that we had earlier today, and we're going to now focus a little bit more on what markets are telling us uh, what, where they're going, and really trying to understand what, how to allocate capital in 2021. And so, Ed, I want to start with you and talking about the U.S. equity market, because in the macro area, you're talking about uh, a lot of what I perceive to be tailwinds for the U.S. equity market. So how do you think about the current valuation within the, the equity market and what fundamentals are telling you uh, as an allocator today? So I think about one thing, money. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, 
we talked about the money, money supplies. And uh, I think uh, Jim mentioned something like 15% money supply aggregate of about 70 trillion. Uh, but the Fed's balance sheet will increase $120 billion a month. Again, as, as somebody said earlier, I'm just counting, just counting. And ECBs will do the same, same thing. So you have you know, about uh, 240 billion a month, uh, 12 months. So you're talking about essentially $3 trillion increase in just those two balance sheets. And Japan is doing it, uh, Canada, Bank of England. And so every asset price is, is biased upward. Bitcoin, 100%. Tesla, house prices, gold prices, uh, sports team prices, uh, football coaches, <laughs> they're almost an asset in themselves. So yeah, that's, the, that's my, first, my first thought. Now, what can derail that uh, is if you get into inflation and Fed tightening. And I think the market will drop like a stone uh, when the Fed starts to hint at tapering, uh, but you know at the moment, you know they're not they're not doing that. And then the second part uh, is the economy, and I would be perfectly happy if the economy grew, say, four four percent this year. Now, I think it might grow three times that. And once you do that, then you start to get into better earnings. Uh, but I don't need it. I'm just saying. I think that's the plan B. And uh, with the dollar going down, uh, that is a, almost a one for one translation into higher earnings for the foreign, foreign guys. So the earnings picture uh, looks pretty good. And uh, then as our uh, policy making guru, Krishna Guha says, uh, the Fed is providing Tina on steroids which you get the picture. And then I'll, I'll close with, he also has the double dovish. One, they wanna get inflation above two, which I agree uh, with Rosie, that's pretty tough, but that's what they wanna do. And second, we got this a little bit. They want the unemployment rate to get back down to 3% because it looks like when it was there before the pandemic hit, we were starting to lift the low income, the Hispanics, the, the black, uh, without education, the thing was getting a little, little bit better. And so we would like to, the Fed would like to get, uh, get us back there and see if we can make progress on the income inequality aspect. But in the meantime, the blown up asset prices all right, so with that, uh, Rosie, uh, Ed was kind of mentioning you there too. I've read a lot of your stuff recently calling uh, this a, a big bubble uh, type area that, that's being thrown around a lot again after the asset price acceleration in the fourth quarter. How are you thinking about the valuation within the equity market today? Well, look, the, um, the valuations in the equity market, uh, ipso facto, were tied to where valuations are uh, in the rates market. And so you have a situation today, for example, because of the Fed's actions, uh, that the average yield on a one to three year piece of corporate paper today uh, offers almost no premium at all uh, over agency debt, uh, and which is remarkable when you consider that agency debt actually does have a guarantee. So. Uh, that's really the insane world we have to invest in, uh, which is when you have a situation where central banks have allowed investors uh, to treat corporate credit as agency debt, uh, when you have a situation where uh, default rates in speculative grade is about 8%, uh, and yet forget spreads because spreads don't compensate you against uh, default rate. Uh, and you have in the high yield market uh, an average rate of roughly four and a half percent. So we live in a world where high yield is neither high uh, nor is it yield. 
So what's happened here from a valuation perspective, uh, which is why people like Robert Schiller and, and then reiterated at the Q&A from Jay Powell uh, back in uh, December, uh, is that uh, when you permit the actual discount rate, you should be using in your DCF analysis to gravitate towards the risk-free rate. And the risk-free rate is being pinned close to zero. And then you have the central bank pledging it pledging to keep it there for the next three years, uh, then who knows where these valuations are going to go. I didn't tell anybody, buy the market, sell the market. I don't tell people to go short. I'm saying we are in an epic bubble, uh, a central bank manufactured bubble. And, uh, you know, you had a bubble in 1999, took 12, 18 months. You had a bubble in 06, uh, took about 18 months. You, you can certainly have fun creating a bubble. My concern is that everybody know, thinks that they know that they, when they can time the exit, everybody is a great market timer. Uh, we are in a bubble of historical proportions. And uh, I guess when you're in a world uh, where $18 trillion of global bonds trade with a negative yield, uh, then I suppose that's possible. You know, we talk about uh, the stock market. Look, there's parts of the stock market that aren't so crazily uh, priced. Uh, but you could actually argue that, uh, that there's bubbles everywhere and a lot of it is really just coming out of the rates market. Uh, and, you know, we have a situation, I mean, you know, I, I think that this past year was really a year where the bear market was in rational thought. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey was saying earlier about nobody's complaining about the fact we got of helicopter money. I haven't heard anybody talk about maybe one of the big events for 2020, uh, which is that after Hertz already declared bankruptcy, there are people out there lining up to buy its stock. Uh, you know, we have Tesla, which in its whole history has one year of really generating any free cash flow. Uh, biggest addition of the S&P on record. Uh, you know, we have a 15% deficit GDP ratio going up. The Fed balance sheet, 30% of GDP and going up. We have 20% of the S&P 500 are replete with zombie companies, which means they're, they're being allowed to stay alive. Nobody has considered that maybe Fed policy by maintaining excess supply is actually proving to be deflationary. Here we have in China, at least, they're clamping down and allowing defaults. We're, we're not letting it happen. 20% of the members of the S&P 500 uh, fill the companies that can't even uh, meet their debt servicing obligations out of their internally <laughs> generated revenues is really quite incredible in its own right. But it does point to uh, a belief uh, that the Fed is going to be there to bail you out. So even for someone who's been cautious like me, we have to recognize that this has been a manufactured uh, heads you win, tails you win market. Uh, it has nothing to do with the fundamentals. The fundamentals in the economy are actually not good at all. Uh, you know, uh, Jeffrey said earlier about average hourly earnings, that might be one of the worst wage measures you want to look at. Personal income, which is 80% of the U.S. economy, was negative 1% in November. It's been down for the past five months, negative 10% personal income in total. And the reason for that is that even though we brought back half the jobs, 10 million jobs, the withdrawal of fiscal stimulus has been so powerful that personal income is down for the past five months, negative 10%. Uh, and so what do you know? We have to line up again for more fiscal stimulus uh, I don't think the fundamentals uh, in the economy organically, organically, if we take off the training wheels off the bike, the bike is going to fall. So I don't know how you can talk about positive fundamentals. You know, there's somebody on CNBC the other day, I'm watching him on TV. He's there saying, oh, I'm bullish on earnings like Ed is. Earnings are going to go up 20% this year. Really? Yeah. Earnings are going up 20%. Meanwhile, the consensus on earnings for 2021, a year ago, uh, was 13% higher than it is today. The consensus on earnings, because we're coming off such a deeper base, 
is 13% lower than it was a year ago, but the market's up more than 15%. And of course, all I'm talking about here are inflated multiples getting more and more inflated, uh, primarily exactly for the reason is because of where the risk-free rate is right now. And it's next to impossible. Really, you can forecast a jack in the beanstalk valuation for the stock market based on where, uh, uh, where uh, the risk-free rate is that you'd be using in your DCF. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the debt markets. To me, it's crazy, crazy. Uh, you know, the, I mean, the debt guru here is Jeffrey Gunlock. Like, we're not scratching our heads thinking that in, if this was not a Potemkin world, uh, if this was not some sort of bizarre world, that seriously, Peru, a junk bond, they can actually issue a century bond, 170 basis points over treasuries, 3.3%. I mean, I would back up the truck and buy long treasuries all day long. Peru? And then two weeks ago, Ivory Coast is in a workout plan with the IMF and they issue a 10-year bond that's oversubscribed because of the stretch for yield. This country is in an IMF program. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. I think that we can develop some themes. Uh, I certainly believe, as Jeffrey said earlier, the work from home theme, that ain't going away. <laughs> so anything related to wiring up your home continuously to be your office, uh, that's a secular theme. And that affects a whole bunch of industries and rather positively. I would say that the one elephant in the room, the one thing I'm really worried about, and there's a few things, is one of the big sources of stimulus has been all these loan forbearance. You can't evict tenants uh, out of their apartments. Uh, loan forbearance programs in the housing market, uh, will, they, will they ever end? Uh, and on top of that, commercial real estate to me, uh, because if you believe as I do that work from home is a secular theme, there's going to be a lot of commercial real estate that has to be reconfigured or mothballed. And we haven't seen all the subleasing in the major urban areas of America uh, coming to the fore. Um, this is going to be, again, you know, people are talking about the light at the end of the tunnel. At some point in 2021, we're going to be pricing in life beyond that light. And there's a lot of potholes, a lot of uncertainties. And one of them is going to be, and there's so much debt back in commercial real estate. What is the outlook for that? especially in New York City, but in other urban areas over the next several years. That to me is an elephant in the room that I think we'll be talking about. I, I, I actually made my career talking about what things that other people aren't talking about. And I'd say that commercial real estate is going to be an elephant in the room beyond 2021. All right. Uh, anybody else want to talk about the U.S. equity market and valuation? Jim, Danielle? Oh, Danielle, you got your hand up. Go for it. Well, you know, I, I, I think... I think perspective is important, and I, and I think historical perspective is important. I, I, I keep the talking heads on, on mute most of the time, but the idea, the very idea that we're at the advent of the dawn of a new bull market. So a good, good friend of all, uh, many of us here, uh, Philippa Dunn, a few, week, a few weeks ago, she put out something called the Roaring Twenties. Everybody's been putting out something called the Roaring Twenties. Well, it, it took the, the Schiller-Cape ratio back to 1881. So if you look at that long history, December 2020, December 2020, so we're talking about exactly 100 years ago, the PE on the S&P hit its lowest level on record of 4.8. So as of yesterday's close, 33.7 on that same multiple, that same gauge, we're exactly seven times the price to earnings ratio today exactly 100 years later than December 2020 when stocks were at their cheapest. Their second cheapest was 1982. That was 6.8. And that was the back the truck up moment to this day. Because uh, you could have just sat in there and just ridden it and, and gone away while bond yields fell. But I think that perspective is important for us to say that, that, that from a starting point of a multiple that's seven times the historic low point, we're going to start from here with Rosie's Beanstalk. It, it, it's, it's hard to get my head around that. Throw in a, a couple of things about valuation. Uh, Wall Street's favorite metric is 12 month forward PE ratio. And the S&P right now it's 25. It's highest it's ever been was 1999 to 26, which was largely acknowledged to be the bubble peak during the tech boom. Um, 
Wall Street's estimates for, let's just go with the strategist, uh, for the end of 21 is 4,200 on the S&P, you know, buck 75 on earnings. They still have the PE ratio of 25 at the end of the year. So you're buying what is historically an overvalued market and your bet is it's going to stay that way at least for another year or so. So no value in this market. Now, now I've said that, um, what causes it to go down? I'm agree with Ed, it's inflation. It's inflation and the Fed forcing the, them to be tight. As I've liked to say, interest rates going up or down, <clears throat> interest rates going up, let me narrow it down a little bit more. And it's neither good nor bad, it depends on why. If interest rates are being driven higher because nominal growth is being driven higher by real growth, that's good. And it's okay that interest rates can go up. If it's being driven by inflation that's driving nominal growth up, that's not good. And that could cause problems. So you're forced into a market that is fully valued, if not overvalued. And the bet is it's going to stay that way for a long period of time. And then a final comment uh, to Rosie. Agency debt is yielding the same thing as corporate debt. Well, sure it should. 13.3 programs, the, government, uh, the Fed has turned corporate bonds into agency debt. They're going to buy them back from you if, they, if there's a problem. So either the company's going to pay you or the Fed's going to take them off your hands at par. Either way, they've become the same credit risk as an agency right now. Yeah, they've closed the 13.3 programs for now, but the perception is the minute that there's a wobble in the market, they'll come right back. You know, that, was my major, that was my major point. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to jump in here. If you add up what Jim and Ed and Rosie described, you're talking about stagflation. You're talking about a melt up in the markets in the in the medium term, and a stagflationary outcome. And well, the Fed you, cannot do anything about that. Yeah, well, when you talk about a melt up too, that's usually one of the signs of a bubble. The bubble isn't a gradual growth rate, and asset prices just grind higher. They're typically before a bubble bursts. There's a melt up phase. So. Jeffrey, what do you think about the fourth quarter performance of risk assets, asset price inflation? Pick your favorite barometer of sentiment right now. Um, do, are we experiencing the melt-up phase um, in the cycle or is, it, is there more to come? We're certainly in the middle of a melt-up phase. And I'm not just talking about the stock market. I'm talking, let's just start with the poster child of Bitcoin. Obviously, Bitcoin is in a melt-up phase. It was in a melt-up phase in 2017, and I was on CNBC, and the uh, uh, and all it was all Bitcoin all the time. They had a crawler going and the whole thing, and Bitcoin was at uh, like 16,500 or something. And I said, I don't really have an opinion, but if you force me to do something, I would I would sell it. And it went up to 19,000 like the next day. That's what a melt up looks like. That seems to be what's ha happening right now. But I think Ed and Rosie are right on right on target when they talk about manufactured bubble and it's all about money and that when it changes, like Ed says, it'll drop like a stone. But right now, you know, it's, what was that fellow uh, uh, from uh, uh, Citibank? I think, was it Citibank or Merrill? Charlie, Chuck I can't Prince. remember. Chuck Prince. Chuck Prince, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the music's still sort of playing. Of course, when he said that, it was just about to end. But the one thing that Rosie said, he looks for things that people aren't talking about. I appreciate that uh, about uh, Rosie. I uh, look for things that are changing, that are long-term trends that look like they might be changing. And I see a lot of it. I see the, the US did not outperform emerging markets last year. That's the first time in a long time. And emerging, emerging Asia outperformed the United States by a lot. Uh, emerging Latin America was weak. So there was a, a very disparate outcome in emerging markets, but uh, growth value has started outperform growth, actually outperformed by a lot uh, recently. Uh, uh, you're seeing it in terms of uh, the super six that as I call them, the FANGs plus Microsoft there. They're not really outperforming anymore. Uh, growth isn't outperforming value. These, these things are all, all turning. And where I am is I am, my number one conviction idea, and this has been the case for quite a while now, is that the US dollar is going down. And it didn't look that way as it was a flight to quality asset during the initial phase of lockdown, but it's fallen pretty far since then. And it seems like it's just persistently weak all the time. And it should be. 
we got the Fed committed, and this is key, and Rosie is so spot on that this is all driven by the promise of essentially zero interest rates for years to come. It's driven by, by a manufactured process that interest rates are so low. And also the debt, Rosie mentioned 15% of GDP, that's the, that's the one, that's the official debt. There's another trillion on top of that that's kind of off the, off the uh, standard counting mechanism. So we're really running about 20% deficit. And even the trade deficit, which was gradually gently improving, has reversed meaningfully the other way. So the twin deficits are absolutely exploding. And that is the most important indicator to begin with on your view of the dollar. And the dollar should fall pretty substantially. And that means that some of these, uh, Ed's, Ed's right, that that'll have translation effects for multinationals that could be favorable, but really I think it's time, and I've been recommending this very heavily since the summer, it's time to be as maximum out of the United States in your equities as your asset allocation policy permits. Because the valuations are so uh, ridiculously out of whack and the deficit in the United States is going to be high as far as the eye can see, and the dollar should fall pretty substantially. And so I, I think that there's uh, uh, good places to be where you don't have to make a bet on how long the music keeps going and how high the beanstalk's going to grow. I just think the other markets are, are sort of tagging along on the upside uh, while that's happening. It even happened during the crazy year of 2020. You mentioned that um, corporates are like agency uh, uh, yields, and that's true. What's, what's even more interesting to me is that investment grade corporate bonds yield the same as the 30 year treasury to no defaults at all. And look, th there's almost no way to win on long term investment grade corporate bonds versus a 30 year treasury. If we, if we have a rise in interest rates, you lose on, on duration. If you have a downgrade scenario on the corporate bonds, you're going to lose even if interest rates fall on the treasury. And while 1.7 on, on a 30-year treasury certainly isn't going to meet most people's investment program goals, you do have the ability to make money on the thing. I mean, it's, it's not insane to think that under a certain scenario, the 30-year treasury could go down 100 basis points in yield. It was down 100 basis points in yield last year on a short-term basis intraday. At least it hedges the risk in your portfolio. So as, as negative as I really am fundamentally on the bond supply and on steep and, and had been for some time forecasting a steepening yield curve, which I'm getting less committed to because of the Fed's ability to yield curve peg, at least you have a diversifier in there potentially. So I think the corporate bond market, I, I'd rather own certain equities than corporate bonds. And if I'm looking for a bad economic outcome, I don't want corporates, I want, I want treasury bonds. Last point, there, you talked about Peru's 100 year bond and it is pretty, pretty crazy. Watch it go up to a price of 180 or something too uh, in, in, the, in the year 2021. I, I think we saw that, I think Jim knows this one with like Austria was it, their 100 year bond? Didn't it go to like 200 or something? I don't remember. 250 what I think, yeah. That's, yeah, 250. Um, you know, so uh, uh, there's there's all of this crazy stuff that's going on in the shadows of the bond market and the things where retail investors don't really have any visibility into. And I'm talking now, Rosie mentioned CMBS. We can talk about CLOs. We can talk about um, certainly many, many corporate bonds. These things get issued and they're massively oversubscribed. Uh, during the fourth quarter of 2020, you get, you get some of these things that you couldn't sell at all in March or April because of the market dislocation. And you're starting to see things across the capital structure for securitized products, where it's like, well, the AAAs, those, are, those have been easy to sell ever since the Fed walked in. They're fully recovered and then some. But then you go down into like single B and areas where Maybe uh, there could be long-term problems that Rosie talked about with some of the underlying assets. And these things are oversubscribed five, six, eight times and with pretty, pretty robust issuance too. Jeffrey, so, there was a CMBS deal this morning. Our, our guys were telling us that the AAAs, it's a floating rate deal, something you couldn't sell the floating rate. 
last year. First deal of the year. Triple A's were done at LIBOR plus 80, 15 times oversubscribed. And that's the yeah. early indication, right? That's today in the market. What, what, what I find so fascinating is that with all of this huge increase in global debt, there seems to be more than ample demand. That's what all of these oversubscriptions imply. And so there's all kinds of uh, ramifications to the, the Fed's operation, especially when they guarantee years of zero interest rates and, and uh, programs as Jim talked about, where if there is a wobble, they'll show up. And so they've turned the whole thing into a kind of a non-asset class, unfortunately. And so not surprising that people are interested in something that doesn't have uh, basically a negative yield, even pre-tax. So that's where the market is. I, I'm, I'm really looking for, and I'm, I'm uh, committed to the idea that the US market may be propped up by the Fed, it certainly is for now, but these other markets are already performing. And, and you know, parts of the market, we talked about how not everything is a ridiculous multiple in valuation. I mean, energy was down pretty hard last year in terms of its price. I mean, the dispersion in sectors of the equity market uh, reflect the unevenness of the economic situation thanks to all of the programs. So you had technology up almost 50% last year and you had energy that was down almost 40% last year. And there's a long-term cyclical pattern that, uh, that energy and financials have very different performance from technology and healthcare. And it, it got to a really extreme level in the summer of this year, and it has started to significantly reverse. I mean, and energy's not doing well, financial. So I think the rotational concept seems to be in play here. Uh, and these trends were very long in the tooth, but very persistent, US outperformance, technology outperformance, and the like. And everywhere I look, I'm seeing examples where there's at least preliminary and in sometimes fairly convincing preliminary evidence that those trends have already reached the end of the line and are reversing. So yeah. go, ahead. go ahead, Daniel. It, uh, very short note, it's just that Jeffrey brings up two critical areas of consolidation in 2021 where nimble investors who understand that the, the sectors of financials and of energy are going to continue to benefit from this massive consolidation move, especially because the majors currency right now, their stock prices have gone up so quickly, they'll be able to, to, to take out acquisition targets very quickly. So this is, it's going to be a dynamic area in 2021. That, that's what is going to lead me to the next set of questions here too. Uh, what you described is kind of growth versus value, Jeffrey. So Ed, um, you know, the, the death of value has been reported for how many, uh, how many years consecutively here? I think the divergence between growth and value in 2020, uh, at least in the large cap space, was the greatest on record uh, in the U.S. equity market. So how are you thinking about uh, the potential for the rotation? Is the value rotation real? I'll start with you and, and kick that around the table. Yeah, so you're starting with the wrong guy. The, uh, <laughs> it's not, a, it's not a, a place that I spend a lot of time on. My main feeling, uh, and I was listening to Jeffrey on, and uh, Rosie on the craziness in the fixed income markets uh, is that all the money inflation is going to create inflation in different asset prices. And I, I find it very difficult to know which ones are going to be kissed by this, whether it's the emerging markets or whatever. And so I don't have a real strong, I, I would want to, uh, I'm, a, I'm an expert on the three Super Bowl markets. The 20s, Japan in the 80s, and then the 90s here. There are only three, so you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. And the PEs ended up around 30, maybe 28 to 40. That's what they ended up at. And the interest rates were around five or six percent at the end. Uh, so I try and look at things from the way other people look at them. And the, the, the numbers that are going to be coming up are 4000 on the S&P and $200 on earnings. And you can, you can do the math pretty easy. 
and, and so that's what people are going to be you know, talking about as you go through. Now, the question is whether or not the $200 on earnings is, uh, you know, pie in the sky or something. But uh, Jeff, on the, on the question you're asking, let, let me ask uh, our, our colleagues here to answer that, because I, I really don't have a strong view on value versus growth. Jim, you want to take that, Rosie? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think that there's one other thing we need to keep in mind. I, I alluded to this in the first section, uh, and Jeffrey brought it up. The dispersion in the S&P sectors, and I'm looking at a sheet right now with the numbers on them, are truly unprecedented. Here's the year-end numbers for the S&P sectors um, right now. Information tech was up 44%, and um, energy was down 34%. That is an all-time record of dispersion from the best to the worst sector in a year. And you throw those two out, you still have utilities up half a percent and you have financials down 2%, but then you also have consumer discretionary up 33 and you have um, telecom up 24. That, even after you've taken out tech and energy, is still a huge gap to see between the, the sectors in any given year. What's going on here? There was a shift coming out of the March low with either the CARES Act money or a rethinking of the market that retail investors have taken over. And they're now back to picking stocks. And they love to pick you know, all the work from home stocks, all the tech stocks, all the story stocks are, are getting picked and they seem to shun a lot of the other stocks. That's why I think you saw the massive amount of uh, the rally in growth. They understand those stocks. Um, you know, they, they understand those stocks and those stocks will go and they don't understand a lot of the, um, a lot of the other stocks. I'll give you an example in one, Mr. Sherman, you'll appreciate uh, a stock, which I'm going to tease here a little bit in our best ideas section is market access online um, corporate bond um, platform. Um, it was up 60% last year. It has been one of the best S&P 500 companies in the last decade. Now, if I tweet out, I like Zoom, I'll get 500 responses. If I tweet out, I like market access, I'll get three responses. No one understands it because this market is driven by retail investors that understand the growth stories. And that is showing up in this massive dispersion in the returns that you see in the markets. And it's also being compounded too with what's been going on in the options market as well. The, it's astounding the level of small trader activity in, this, in the options market is dwarfing institutional activity. Basically, the options market has now become a small retail market of people trading less than 10 contracts, even one contract, and the most popular option is they, they, every Friday they, they list another option that, is, that expires in a week. And this, so that the weekly options are dominating the activity. So if you wanna know what the options market is, it's, a, it's somebody buying Tesla calls that are gonna mature in a week or two, betting that there's gonna be another 20% move in the stock in two weeks. And with the leverage they're getting with their options, they're gonna make six X on their money. That is what's become of these markets. Gone are the days of the uh, mutual fund or the professional investor waving his hand saying, I've got a long-term plan, put your money with me. And even fraying at the edges right now is the passive investor saying, put your money in the S&P 500 fund uh, because that's the way you wanna invest. In ETF land, in the month of December, the number one performing fund in terms of inflows Beat spiders, beat everything was the ARK Innovation Fund, Kathy Woods Fund. Just went through the roof. $18 billion fund right now is getting as much money in the door almost as State Street is, which is like 100 times larger than her. And that's an actively managed fund. It's not a passive fund. And it's actively managed with our largest holding being Tesla um, right now. 10% of the fund uh, is in Tesla. So there has been a wholesale shift in the way that people invest. And that is that they want to buy, they want to buy individual stocks. They don't want funds. They don't want passive investments and they want them on a tremendous amount of leverage as well. That's unique to the US. 
You're not seeing that in any other market. And as a matter of fact, the last thing I'll bring up is while the S&P was, uh, I, I've been, I'm looking at MSCI numbers here. Uh, the US on a uh, local currency basis was up 21% MSCI last year for 2020. Just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, Canada was up three. The UK was down two. Switzerland was down 13. The Euro uh, zone was down two, highlighted by France being down five as well. Australia was down one uh, as well. Uh, Japan was up eight. Other than the US, the rest of the world stock markets did not have a particularly good year, but then they don't have a retail mania like we have unfolded in our markets this year. You know, you mentioned the ARK Innovators ETF. I, I saw one day, and it was obviously thin trading during the holiday session, that it had more volume in it during the day, intraday, than any of the sector spider ETFs out there that day. So it reminds me back when gold, or was it the silver, it was the gold ETF actually had more volume than the spiders back in that mania that we had, I think it was like 2012 or so. But um, so as we think, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, real quick uh, on the ARC funds, yeah. they, right before Christmas, they took and they got five funds. They're all fairly small. They took in $1 billion in a day. That's usually what you'll see happen with like spiders and stuff. I mean, that's the amount of money that is flying into those funds. It's just unprecedented for an actively managed ETF to see that kind of money come in the door. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, if I can add here, just from an economic point of view, uh, we survey about uh, 50 different industries every week, companies in them. And uh, Jim, to your point, the dispersion has been unprecedented. So trucking, China, home builders and retailers, there's, those surveys are all up a lot. And at the bottom, uh, airlines, shipping companies, commercial real estate, uh, and restaurants are all down a lot. So the economy has been bifurcated. Uh, and I think economic performance, you know, those, those, those countries you mentioned, haven't been doing, weren't doing particularly well either compared to the U.S. That may change, you know, in 2021, but uh, in 2020. You know, I'd like to uh, expand on that a little bit about different sectors of the economy. You know, one thing that's been red hot, obviously, is housing, residential housing. It pointed out the prices are up and, you know, the purchase index is, is up and all that stuff. But there's a big dispersion in terms of, of retail sales and spending that is not often talked about. There's been a collapse in services spending. And there's been a huge increase in good spending focused a lot on durable goods. Durable goods spending has gone up a lot. And there is a little bit of a dark side to home prices going up when wages aren't really going up. I mean, it doesn't make housing more affordable for the future. And when you have durable goods propelling retail sales, that's not something you can extrapolate into the future very intelligently because they're durable goods. They're kind of one-time purchases by the definition, at least for several years to come. So I think there's, there's things to um, be gleaned from parsing out this data instead of the, just the aggregates that we look at. And that's the theme that Jim's talking about with countries, that Ed's talking about with his famous company surveys. And it's also true uh, in the dynamics in the, in the economy. So uh, I, I just want to point that out, that I think that some of the gains in the economy are really pulling perhaps a few years of future demand forward into where we are today. And that was certainly true of automobile sales, you know, used cars exploded and all that stuff. Some, some of these things are clearly accelerating uh, from the, uh, com coming forward from the future. And then finally, one thing we haven't talked about, one of the reasons that the US stock market did super well uh, under the first part of the Trump administration was there was something there that you might remember that was a corporate tax cut. And Joe Biden campaigned on reversing, at least in significant part, precisely that tax cut, raising corporate taxes part of the way, more than half, I think, back to where they were before. 
Well, if, if he ends up getting that through, that means that the PE is actually about three points higher than you think it is, because you're gonna have that effect on the net if those taxes are raised. So it's just, it's an issue that I, uh, it's, it's funny when corporate tax cuts were in the air, it was on every Wall Street research note as a bullish talking point. I don't see anybody talking about how tax increases could be a, a, a just a, a further, you know, uh, weight on the, the uh, already high valuations by historical standards. Yeah, part, part of that tax cut too was um, eliminating the inability of companies to, to um, use their debt or their interest coverage as a deduction too, once you hit certain levels. But with the refinancing wave, I think that that's been eradicated or at least pushed off in the future. Yeah. Uh, let's take a bigger, let's take a, oh, go ahead, Jeffrey. I just want to say one more thing about the, the refinancing wave. You know, it's no surprise that cash out refinancing should be a popular thing because we're in an environment where you might, you might be kicking yourself if you don't take the maximum out because it might get, you know, sort of forgiven. So, you know, leverage up your house as much as you possibly can and then default on it. It's sort of like if, 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 if you're sending a child to school, even if you can afford it, Maybe you should have them take out tons of student loans because they might get canceled. I mean, there's all <laughs> kinds of behavioral behavioral modifications that lie underneath the surface here. 